This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. Now at 6, it is a Storm Team 6 alert day. The heat and humidity still on full blast, but people are managing to get out and have a blast at events like the Indiana Black Expo Summer Celebration. Good evening and thanks for joining us here at 6. I'm Nicole Griffin in the Tracking Center with meteorologist Kyle Mounts. Kyle, I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of glad we're inside in the air conditioning right now. Yeah, a popular place to be. Not a whole lot of people spending much time outdoors unless you're in the pool, probably. Our temperature today, yeah, it was another hot one here. We made it into the lower 90s, 93 degrees. It's not a record that 103 set in 1934, but it felt like 103 degrees earlier this afternoon. Right now, our temperature still sits at 90 toasty degrees here in the Circle City, that dew point in the lower 70s. So yeah, we still have a lot of humidity out there. Fortunately, a little bit of a southwest breeze at 15 miles per hour. So it's a hot breeze, but at least it's stirring things up a little bit. Feels like 102 in Lafayette, Bloomington and Muncie. Right now 103 is your heat index in Peru with that temperature of 93. So temperatures very slow to cool this evening as we go through the next 12 hours. In fact, we'll spend much of the overnight in the 80s into the middle 70s by tomorrow morning. Now Storm Team 6 radar is showing that the thunderstorm activity is staying off to the north. Expected to be there through the overnight, but tomorrow a marginal risk across all of central Indiana We'll take more of a look at that timeline in a few minutes. All right, Kyle, thank you again. The extreme heat is sticking around through tomorrow. Go to the RTV6 app or the IndyChannel.com to get real-time updates on the forecast. Plus, we have a list of cooling centers around central Indiana. Again, that's on the RTV6 News app and the IndyChannel.com. The Indiana Black Expo Summer Celebration is in full swing tonight in downtown Indianapolis. For nearly a half of century, the expo has been known as a party with a purpose. One of the expo's main goals has been to connect black-owned businesses with Indiana customers. RTV6 reporter Cameron Riddle joins us live with more on how the expo is creating new outlets for businesses. Cameron. Hey, Nicole, good evening. It is nice and cool in here as we are live here at IBE. And it is lively, as you can see. And one of the places that it is lively at is here at the vendor's booth. Everyone comes here for a different reason, leaving them behind a different memory. And that meaning is different for each person. That meaning is also evolving for the people who are operating at these vendor tables. And they say this is now a new opportunity given to them for growth. The owners of Nick Knackery and Melissa's Fancy Feed who uh, do the difficult task, as it already is, to sell custom fit products to a customer who's never actually touched what they are buying before they buy it. Their online stores sell handmade designer shoes and custom toe rings, two products which you can't try on through the screen of a phone or computer. The Black Expo gives their stores a leg up, allowing them a rare and in-person opportunity with customers. And that's why I'm constantly looking for opportunities like this one to showcase my my products. This is something where people have to be custom fit, so that's hard to do on the internet. And of course, thousands of people have already checked out these uh, uh, vendor locations throughout IBE. You can still come down through 9 o'clock tonight and from 12 to 7 tomorrow to see uh, these stores that you would normally see online in their temporary brick and mortar homes for the 49th annual summer celebration. We're live tonight. I'm Cameron Rodel, RTV6. Cameron, thank you. The Indianapolis 10 Point Coalition will be back downtown tonight to help out at the expo. Reverend Charles Harrison tweeting out there will be about 50 OGs and peacemakers downtown. They will mainly be focusing on the area around the mall and canal, working in partnership with IMPD. Tonight, an organization in Johnson County that helps hundreds of senior citizens and senior citizens relies on that organization now has its stolen van back. This is a story we first told you about last week as they called on the community to help them find it. We were there today as the group got back their wheelchair accessible van. They received a call this morning that police found it in Indianapolis at a McDonald's on Southeastern Avenue. They say someone has been living inside the van and it's going to take a lot of work to get it cleaned up, but they are happy to have it back. 
We are so grateful to receive our vehicle back in one piece. The things inside, yes, we've got to get that process. We've got to get it detailed. There's a million things we need to do before we can put a precious senior on here. No word yet tonight from police on whether they have any suspects, but the executive director with Johnson County Senior Services says getting back the van is critical in helping seniors get to and from life-saving medical appointments. Looks like this really is the last call for all Scotty's Brew House and three Wiseman locations here in central Indiana. The sign on the door at Scotty's on the Butler campus says it all. The remaining restaurants are seizing operations after today. This comes months after Scotty's owners filed for bankruptcy. Most locations begin closing in phases, often with no warning to customers or employees. We reached out to Scotty's Brew House for information and we are still waiting on a response. Tonight police and gas tonight police and gas city are looking into the possible connection between a robbery at a cell phone store and a recent robbery in Muncie. On Thursday, gas city police responded to an armed robbery at Verizon Wireless. Meanwhile, last week on July 9th, a T-Mobile store in Muncie was also robbed. Investigators are asking the public for any information on these cases. If you know anything tonight, contact Muncie Police or Gas City Police. We have all the details on the RTV6 News app. Today marks 13 years since a Carmel High School police officer died in a hit and run crash. And tonight the plea for information about the driver who left the scene continues. A new PSA released today is aimed at bringing closure to the family of Ronald Upsitnik. The crash happened around 10.30 p.m. on July 20th, 2006 at the intersection of 96 and Meridian. Witnesses say a small black two-door sports car with a rear spoiler pulled to the side of the road after the crash, but then left the scene northbound on Meridian Street. Upset Nick, who was on a motorcycle, died at the scene. A $1,000 reward is being offered for tips submitted to Crime Stoppers that lead to an arrest. Two Metro police officers on motorcycles were injured in a crash today on the west side. It happened just before 4 o'clock near 38th Street and Industrial Boulevard. No details yet on how this crash happened. We're told the officers' injuries are not life-threatening. RTV6 is working for you and getting results. A woman says her mother now has a brand new headstone after mowing crews at a cemetery in Rush County damaged it. This is a story we first told you about in November of last year. Faith Green says solar lights, flower urns, and her mother's headstone were damaged by an employee at the town of Carthage Cemetery. A town spokesman says the employee who mows the grass damaged it while mowing and they took full responsibility. But but now, nine months later, Green says she now has a brand new beautiful headstone for her mother. President Trump is doubling down on his criticism of four Democratic Congresswomen while defending attendees of his rally who chanted, send her back. ABC's White House correspondent Tara Palmieri has the very latest. After voicing his disapproval for those chants at a rally this past Wednesday, President Trump now doubling down with another attack on Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. I'm unhappy when a Congresswoman goes and said, I'm going to be the president's nightmare. She's lucky to be where she is. An apparent response to Omar's comments as she was greeted by supporters upon her return to her home state. His nightmare is seeing the beautiful mosaic fabric of our country welcome someone like me as their member of Congress. And the Democrats hoping to replace the president also taking aim at his comments. After this week and the things that the president said um, and the chant uh, that he basked in at that rally um, about a congresswoman actually from my state um, and that is makes it very clearer than ever uh, that our literally our democracy is at stake. Let me just say this as an American citizen that I never ever would have believed in my lifetime that I would hear the ugly racist remarks coming from the President of the United States. Matt Dowd says Democrats vying for the President's job need to go big just like the lunar landing. Democrats need to go big just like that and not be small and divisive as the president seems to have a strategy of. Former First Lady Michelle Obama weighing in with a tweet on Friday, taking an apparent shot at President Trump. 
Quote, what truly makes our country great is its diversity. Whether we are born here or seek refuge here, there's a place for all of us. We must remember it's not my America or your America. It's our America. As the controversy continues, the president is spending the weekend at his New Jersey golf club. Tara Palmieri, ABC News, Washington. 50 years ago today, with the world watching his every move, Neil Armstrong took one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. Next on the News at 6, how the nation is celebrating this landmark moment. Kyle. We've got a little more heat and humidity to get through here before the muggy meter takes a big hit. We're going to talk about a refreshing change on the way. You're watching RTV6 News at 6. Financing for 60 months on some of 2019 Atlas models. This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. Celebrations are going on across the country to mark the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission when Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. Here's ABC's Maggie Ruley from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Tonight, the entire country is counting down. An astronaut Neil Armstrong's hometown. And in Cape Canaveral, Florida, where Vice President Pence greeted the two surviving members of the mission. Apollo 11 is the only event in the 20th century that stands a chance of being widely remembered in the 30th century. At the home of Apollo Mission Control, the Johnson Space Center just outside Houston. Thousands celebrating a monumental moment from 50 years ago. The Eagle has landed. July 20th, 1969. 600 million people around the world were watching on television. One small step for man. One and that moment was made possible in large part because of the men and women sitting in this room. This is the new fully restored mission control from Apollo 11 and everything is exactly as it was on that day. It took 400,000 people working on everything from the spacecraft to computers to spacesuits. Capcom or stay for T1. That's flight director Gene Kranz. He led the crew through those final critical moments. Five decades later, he says it's time we keep going and prove what America is really capable of. It really demonstrated the power of free and open society. But all of a sudden we quit. It's a time for America to wake up, get moving, build the energy and passion and say what America can will, America can do. Well, the celebration is in full swing here at Johnson Space Center. This place is more than just a party. We walked past active mission control while we are here. Now, that's the place where today's scientists are working on the next generation of space travel. And NASA says they plan on putting people back on the moon by 2024. Only this time, they want to keep going. They say maybe they'll make it all the way to Mars. At Johnson Space Center, I'm Maggie Ruley, ABC News. And let's start you off with a view this evening, a very popular place throughout the day, I'm sure, although a little quiet right now on Morse Reservoir, really anywhere on the water, a popular place today. That temperature, 90 degrees in downtown, still a toasty 94 in Kokomo, upper 80s for you in Bloomington. There's that southwest breeze helping us out just a little bit. We need all the help and relief we can get because those heat index values, most areas still running in the triple digits right now. Feels like 102 in Bloomington, Lafayette, and Muncie are. Excessive heat warning goes all the way until 8 o'clock tomorrow evening. So that means even tonight, it's going to be warm out there. Our temperatures still in the lower 90s for you at 7 o'clock. We'll be in the mid 80s by 10. Partly cloudy skies and our sun setting here a little after 9 o'clock. And those temperatures by tomorrow morning, middle to upper 70s. So it's going to be another very warm launch into our Sunday here. And those temperatures, middle 80s for you by mid morning at 10 a.m. We'll have that southwest breeze still around 10 miles per hour. As temperatures make their way back into the lower 90s and that heat index tomorrow afternoon about 100 to 105 degrees. But you notice as we get into the afternoon, we also have that chance for a few showers and thunderstorms as well. So a little bit of heat relief as we go into the afternoon. 90 degrees in Bloomington, 90 in Richmond. But you notice the mid to upper 80s around Lafayette and Peru. That's because that line of thunderstorms will be moving in during the afternoon for you. So here's TrueCast, 4 o'clock tomorrow. You can see around Delphi, Logan's 
transport a few of those thunderstorms. That line moving into the northern suburbs of Indianapolis around 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. So around Lebanon into the uh, Hamilton County area around Carmel. Also toward Franklin as we get a little closer to 730 in the evening. And Columbus also dealing with some of those thunderstorms. So about a six to seven hour window tomorrow night where we could have not only some heavy rainfall but gusty winds. So make sure you've got the RTV6 and the Storm Shield app. So if we do have any warnings that are issued for those winds, they'll be sent right to your phone. That though is where we turn the corner big time heading into our Monday. Look at these temperatures. Not only are they not in the 90s for a high, they're not in the 80s either. Most areas going to settle mid to upper 70s. A nice change here going into the seven day forecast. Over the next few days, 78 will be the high on Monday around 80 degrees on Tuesday. We slowly warm things up a little bit here as we go through the week and also notice after Monday we're pretty dry as well. So we have to get through tomorrow another hot day and then Monday looks really nice. After that refreshing. Yeah, very nice. The humidity that goes away. All right, Kyle. Thank you. Well, still to come a recall alert. If you've recently bought salads or sandwiches at two popular grocery stores, you'll need to know what could be in those products and why you should return them right away. That's why people feel better shopping at Meyer. Check your fridge. Fresh Market and Target are recalling some of their salads and sandwiches. The concern here is over possible listeria contamination. The FDA says the recalled products were made by Archer Farms and Frescott. With Archer Farms, it's the egg salad and deviled egg sandwiches made on June 18th. With Frescott, it's their egg salad too, along with their tuna salad and Thai lobster salad. No one has gotten sick yet, but listeria bacteria can be serious and even deadly for some people including kids. If you have any of the recalled food, you can bring it back to where you bought it for a refund. The cost of medicines can be a financial burden, but several states are coming up with a solution. Instead of throwing out unused medication, they're reusing it safely. Reporter Jace Larson shows us how it works. It's life-saving medicine, and you paid for it with Medicaid tax dollars. But we found that it's being thrown away day after day after day. It's being shredded and destroyed. This medication has already been paid for by Medicare. Once it gets close to expiring, it's taken off the shelves and dumped into giant furnaces. And we're talking millions and millions of pounds of medication each year. Life-saving medications. Former pharmacist Steve Hazlett says he's witnessed a massive oversupply of drugs. Most of them are your expensive, you know, your medications for asthma, diabetes, you know, blood blood pressure, hypertension, um, cholesterol medications that people need uh, on an everyday basis to survive. Fostel Lanfer knows what it's like to not be able to easily pay. The insurance I have right now, I need uh, I need cover of five thousand deductible for I start using my insurance. There is a solution on the horizon, though. Dozens of states have passed laws allowing for drug donation programs, prescription drugs can be donated to low-cost or free clinics. But experts say there's still a whole lot more that needs to be done to help people. The largest company that runs donation programs in the country, Serum, says only some states allow the medication to be donated. And in places like Missouri, Indiana, Michigan, and Florida, you can't even get those meds if they've been donated. None of them are expired, of course. None of them are tampered with. All the seals are intact. Um, and they have to meet all of the refrigeration requirements or any of the other requirements, just like any other medication that would come into a pharmacy. Jeff Martin is the executive director of Open Bible. That's a group that helps move the donated medication. A lot of these medications were purchased with taxpayer dollars and then were destroyed, and now they're being used to help community members, neighbors uh, throughout our state. And so I think that's a great benefit. He wants to see more of the drugs being donated and given to those that can't afford them. And he's concerned that drug makers, those are the same ones making multi-billion dollars in profit have little incentive to push these programs. But in states like Colorado, lawmakers have aimed to protect the programs and those who donate, shielding them from liability in hopes that it will make more people want to donate. I'm Jace Larson reporting. At Ashley Home Store, this is home. Patriotism was in full display at the Marion County Fairgrounds. This huge American flag welcomed all who came to honor veterans. In Indianapolis, this was the Mayor's Veterans Appreciation Day, which included the leaders from Indianapolis, Lawrence, and Beach Grove. Veterans received special recognition during the 90-minute ceremony. Those who attended also had a chance to connect with many groups which provide veteran-related services. 
A St. Louis woman who gave birth on July 11th at 7.11 p.m. just received a gift of a lifetime from 7.11. Not only did a company rep send Rachel Langford a cute onesie for her adorable newborn baby girl, but the convenience store also pledged thousands of dollars toward a college fund for the girl. Perhaps you can guess just how much. $7,111, of course. That is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a little while before she's going to be yeah. having some big gulps, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, as we go through the next couple of days, good news is you're not going to need too much to cool you off after tomorrow. 92 will be the high with thunderstorms in the afternoon. A few more storms on Monday, Monday but check that out. 78, the high. All right, Kyle, thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here at 11.